When people walk up to me and say, what do you do? And I say, I'm a farmer. They said, where do you farm? Where is the land to farm? There are serious issues affecting this food system from where it comes from up to the shelf in the shop. And you can realize that there are powerful players far stronger than us. Every human being has the right to have enough food. No one should go to bed hungry. What type of governance do we need and how can we ensure that food production is done within planetary boundaries? This is the big challenge, but there are cross-cutting issues. I think the direction of African agriculture should go to agroecology because agroecology is not a tinkering agenda, it's a transformative agenda. And at the center of agroecology is also a right to food. Currently, only 2.7% of the support for agriculture from the European Union goes to agroecology. Uh, Europe facilitates l'exportation vers l'Afrique de ces productions agricoles euh, lourdement subventionnées et cela euh, disqualifie ou réduit l'accès au marché des petits paysans africains qui ont de petites exploitations et qui ne peuvent pas compétir. Our small scale farming system aspiration should not be what we witness in Europe and then because we know that the Europeans are locking a system they cannot get out. We are not in that system. And then we do not want to move toward that system. And what the alternative? Now, in Western Kenya, the land sizes are small. So that means that whatever space that a farmer has on the land then has to be used economically. So then along the contours, we also integrate uh, bananas. Where apart, we can also do the sweet potato. It has to be something that also benefits the farmer. La restauration is une chance for l'Afrique. Not only l'Afrique a 60% des terres arabes non encore emblavées, mais l'Afrique a un tiers du potentiel mondial, à savoir 700, 715 millions d'hectares de terres qui ont encore le, de terres dégradées qui peuvent encore être restaurées. The good thing with the food systems approach is that uh, we're not just talking about farmers. We're now talking about every hectare from the farm to the dining room table, to the fork and knife that we use. And what I like about this discourse is that it now allows everybody to participate. And the best game for us to play is the policy development game. We need land to grow our food. We need land to protect biodiversity. And we need land to mitigate against and adapt to climate change. But how can we ensure that those who do the bulk of these actions also have a fair share to these resources? Finding responses to these questions requires an open dialogue. It further requires that we manage to establish new alliances because still too many continue to protect the status quo. And together, this is our invitation to this dialogue series. Welcome, everyone. Thank you all for joining, and a special welcome to our distinguished speakers and, of course, co-hosts. My name is Dr. Gerrit Hansen. I'm the Program Director, Climate Change at Robert Bosch Stiftung, and it's my pleasure to open the second Land Food Climate Event on behalf of the Foundation. We are extremely grateful to the Arua Center of Excellence in Sustainable Food Systems the Future Africa Project and TMG Research for partnering with us and co-hosting this event series. Robert Bosch Stiftung is one of the major foundations in Europe associated with a private company. Our task is to carry out the legacy of our founder, the industrialist and humanitarian Robert Bosch, who was dedicated to promoting peace, stability, human dignity, and equal opportunities. As today, Peaceful coexistence depends on finding answers to global challenges. The Foundation's international work focuses on pressing issues such as climate change, 
and rising inequality, and is currently developing its focus in sub-Saharan Africa. Our climate portfolio is exclusively focused on land use, or to be more precise, on the climate, biodiversity, and food nexus, and a just transition to a climate and nature positive and more equitable world. The food system is central to our work as a driver of land use change and an essential prerequisite for realizing the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Fatima Denton put it very eloquently during our first land food climate dialogue last month. In fighting climate change, a lot of focus is on the energy system, and rightly so. However, agriculture is the heart of the African continent and crucial to adaptation, mitigation, and climate resilient development pathways. During our first event, it also became very clear that empowering those most directly affected by the food and climate crisis to engage in the development of national pathways is a key to better policies and implementation. Our event today will further elaborate on this issue, how to tackle the implementation gap in the climate space and create enabling environments for climate resilience at the landscape level. I'm looking forward to an inspiring, insightful debate with our amazing panelists and extend a big hand to our moderators who have worked extremely hard to put this event together so close to COP26. And with this, let me hand the floor over to you, Yes and Van Gogh. Welcome, everybody. And I will just give you a quick recap of what we have had until this, which is a second event in our series on land food climate. Our starting point for this series was that until now, discussions in the agriculture and climate space have taken place mostly in silos. So maybe to perhaps oversimplify, just to make a point, uh, the agricultural community is mostly focused on production and ensuring sufficient food. While the climate change community, in a sense, is dealing with the repercussions of some of those actions uh, in terms of unsustainable production or consumption patterns. So this is why we are placing a strong focus on the link between food, food insecurity, exclusion, and climate vulnerability. In our previous event, we discussed how focusing international partnerships around the right to food offers a perspective not only for transforming unequal food systems, it also helps to ensure that those who produce food or are food insecure are also meaningfully included in processes that aim to strengthen climate resilience. One of the strong proposals made in the discussions was that people at the local level need to be much more present in national dialogue processes coming out of the World Food Systems Summit. One of the action points uh, for international partnerships, therefore, is to ensure that we are collaborating with genuinely representative civil society or actors. These are some of those who will fill the gap in the middle, as we are calling it, uh, as we will be examining it, uh, examining it even in more detail today. Since these same issues will also be playing out in the upcoming discussions on climate and adaptation and resilience, let me now invite my colleague and co-moderator, Jess Weigold, to pick up on where we left off at our last event. Welcome, yes. Thank you, Wangu, and uh, thank you all, or welcome back to this event series. Uh, my name is Yes. I have the pleasure to co-facilitate this event together with Wangu. Now, uh, international colleagues keep telling us Germans can't get it short, and so we have given us the title Tackling the Climate Implementation Gap, Our Rights, the Missing Middle. So uh, given remarks by colleagues, I think I'll expand on the elements of this title a little to provide an overview of what it is that we are up to today. Now, climate implementation gap. Today we will focus more on the adaptation side and less on the mitigation side. As you are well aware, um, only 10% of global climate financing is dedicated to this crucial topic of climate adaptation, and we really want, through this event series, emphasize the importance of climate change adaptation. While we focus on adaptation, this should not um, 
be a lack of emphasis or underemphasize the need for Europe and other industrialized continents, so to say, uh, to drastically cut their emissions. If countries in adaptation who face adaptation needs, to a lesser extent Europe does as well, if they are to stand a chance to truly adapt to climate change, we really need to reduce the pace of climate change and we really need to reduce the impact that the climate crisis has. That is, Europe has to drastically cut its emissions. And we want to put it... Um, sorry for the technical hiccup. And we want to put this squarely in front of the bracket and focus on adaptation afterwards. Now, having said this, for us, the climate implementation gap is the gap that exists between international and national commitments towards climate change adaptation and actual adaptation progress on the ground. The term missing middle, Wango has already alluded to. For us, the missing middle, and I apologize for, for using rather nerdy, wonky language, is the, the governance gap that exists between national level initiatives and the local level capacities to actually implement or to scale up. More often than not, national actors do not have sufficient capacities to actually implement their activities at the, at the local level and vice versa. Local organizations often do not find an enabling environment so that they can scale up their activities. Now this gap, this missing middle, this governance gap, uh, we, would, uh, we will be addressing in, this in the very first panel. Um, and we are advancing, as in the previous discussion, the question to what extent is a rights-based agenda the most suitable agenda to really move uh, this ahead. Now, before I introduce uh, the first fascinating panel, our amazing speakers, I would like to invite my colleague Bruno to join us here on stage. Bruno will talk us through the technical details for you guys who participate online to make your voice being heard. Bruno. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this, to this webinar. Uh, my name is Bruno, and I'm just here to tell you a few technical details about the discussion. So first of all, now I'm looking at the right camera. <laughs> so um, first of all, today we have French, Francophone and Anglophone participants, so we therefore have simultaneous French and English interpretation. Um, in order to choose your audio channel, you can locate the interpretation tab at the bottom bar and select your audio channel. This way you can really follow all of the discussion in the language you, you desire. Secondly, uh, this panel, this, this webinar is meant to be interactive, so we do have a Q&A section for participants to interact with the moderators as well as the panelists. You can locate the Q&A section also on the bottom bar and uh, input your questions in there. The questions will be selected and transferred to our wonderful hosts, who will then direct the questions to the panelists. If there are any comments or technical issues, you can write them in the chat, which is also located at the bottom bar, and we'll try to solve the issue as soon as possible. So in a nutshell, questions in the Q&A section, any comments, technical issues in the chat. And on that note, I wish you a great and insightful discussion. Thank you, Bruno. And uh, if you want to applaud afterwards, the pers one of the persons to make this work technically, Bruno is the one to be thanked for. Now, for our first panel, we have uh, three questions that we will uh, dis be discussing. First is to build on our introductions to discuss what actually constitutes this middle, missing middle, what constitutes this governance gap. That's the first question. So the second question then is what are cautionary tales of success as we have labeled them? What are promising avenues to close that gap? And then the third question that we would like to address, what type of alliances or partnerships, as you could have seen in the video, are necessary to pursue these avenues? And with these questions, I thank you again for attending and I hand back over to Wango. Thank you once again. And we will jump right into the first panel, which will be discussing how to understand this missing middle. And our first speaker is Professor Cheikh Mbo from the Future Africa Director of Future Africa at the University of Pretoria. He's going to be looking at how we characterize this missing middle, what are some trends, especially on the African continent, and what are maybe some gaps that international partnerships should be stepping in to address. So welcome, Professor Mbo. 
Thank you so much, Wangu. Um, thank you, yes, uh, colleagues. I have recognized some names. Uh, Yuba Sokona, Suzanne Chomba, uh, all time Ipraf colleagues. I'm very pleased to be uh, on your platform today just to share some framing information about food system and how we trickle down to the African context or what are the main requirements that we should consider in, in just working on the implementation gap. But because before I get to my slides, I just want to commend the choice of the organization today to focus on the implementation gap. There is a lot of information on how to improve food systems. There is a lot of information on different practice in different contexts. The, regi the regional divide on food system has been you know, reported in IPCC in different, uh, different uh, fora. The main issue we are having here, which is absolutely crucial, is how we go from knowledge to action. How do we build, bridge the implementation gap? And there are many ways you can attack, you can, you, can, you can develop these ideas of implementation gap. And I think starting from what we know and how we deploy innovation is something very, very central. In the, on the very first slides here, I would like to bring, if, if the technician can put it on, I would like to bring, um, yeah, just go to the next slide. I would like to bring a framing that we use on the special report on climate change and, and food system that I had the honor to lead with uh, a colleague from the United States, Cynthia Rosenberg, on, on, on sustainable food systems. Um, the central part of this graphic is about food system, previous one. The central part of this of this graphic shows what the food system entails. And it's not only about production, as you rightly say, Wangu, in your introduction, and yes, but it's all about the supply and the demand of food. And in between, a huge area where we can improve our implementation is how to handle food loss and food, food waste. Particularly in Africa, because of the equipment, the type of equipment in place, the type of agriculture we have, the smallholder farmers a practice that is, you know, the dominant model. Food loss become a serious issue. By just resolving the issues of food loss in Africa, a great deal of that yield gap we are talking about can be resolved without additional demand on land, without additional demand on ecosystem services, on water and energy and the like. But if we, if we try to confine our thinking on the food system, we can easily forget other areas which can be seen as strong leverage point of food system, which are the other system which going around food system. The other system are the climate system in place. The impact of climate change on food system is huge. I'm not teaching you anything by telling how temperature rise, you know, extreme events on climate change and the change on the climate parameters would have some kind of uh, implications on the food system we have. On the left side, there is a great deal of land. Nakaja, in the, in, the, in, the, in the movie you just showed before, Luke Nakaja was demonstrating how land restoration is part of the process of recovering fertile land while preserving the fertile land we have. On the right side, the all aspect of availability and access and market and utilization and diet, the human dimension of it, which complement the socioeconomic system, which is the governance system and how the, the consumer behavior are. So it's a conundrum. It's not an easy task and it requires a lot of different disciplines to work together. And the fact of engaging in transdisciplinarity on the food system for the implementation gap is a starting point, is the first option and the last resort when we have to, to resolve it. And this means partnership, as he has mentioned. We can't, none of the institutions across the borders working on food system can address all these demand dimensions alone. We need a diversity of institutions at various scales and most importantly, those institutions at local level who are dealing in the daily basis, uh, you know, the, the, the issues of food system and food supply and diet to, to community. In the next slide for the framing, what I want to show here is what should we consider particularly when we talk about adaptation to climate change, as you rightly mentioned, yes, and, and one. First of all, the trend 
on a food system under climate change. And I insist on that, how food system would evolve under the current trend and the projected trend of, of, of climate change, absolutely central. The release of IPCC 1.5 degree and the first report of IPCC in the working group in the, um, in the, in the air six has shown that we, we will have more drought, we will have more extreme events, many things will happen in climate change. How food system will evolve on that in terms of production, in terms of the risk where we are exposed. The, the climate change also brings the picture of mitigation aspect, which is you know, nested in this very case on adaptation, but that's something we need to, 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 to address. The agroecology that the guy was explaining in terms of uh, you know, uh, doing transformation on agricultural system also respond to the issues of greenhouse gas uh, emissions. And then comes the whole package of climate scenario, climate, uh, climate analogs, uh, the combination between mitigation and adaptation, and more importantly for what comes the, to this meeting today is the issues of enabling conditions, the issues of policy makers, the issues of governance, the issues of funding, uh, you know, new agricultural system that respond to the adaptation need and the climate need. And we have so many cross-cutting issues, uh, you know, that comes with resource areas. But if I had to focus on action areas in this very graph, I will start from the bottom. I will start from the enabling conditions and move forward to the factors that influence the dynamics of food system in, uh, across the globe. So next slide. Um, I want to, to show you how this is a particular study which we are trying to publish, soon publish in Global Climate Alliance, which is showing how food comes into various areas of development that are responding to the adaptation needs, uh, to the ecosystem services, to the nature-based solutions. So the Pro central product. Pro sorry, Professor Mbo, may I ask you to kindly come to a close? The closing is the landscape opportunities we have here are huge. Um, we can't just deal about food system without looking on questions of job opportunities, clean energy, water demand, human capital, local knowledge, and most importantly, the neglected resources and practice we have in Africa. And the last slide shows the importance of integrating all these aspects. Um, the last slide very quickly to integrate all these aspects into different food system components, such as crop production, livestock, transport, processing, et cetera. And more importantly, that's my conclusion. In Africa, a good starting point for implementing uh, the policy on food system is to address food, food loss, food waste, and the optimization of on agriculture input in the system. So that's the few messages and framing information that I wanted to put in place. And thank you for, for the time given. Over to you. Thank you, Professor Mbo. And please stay on the line. We will be inviting a panel discussion afterwards. But thank you very much, really, for framing our discussion so aptly um, and really putting the food systems perspective left, wird left, right, and center of the debates that we are now having. As part of this systems perspective, we want to emphasize also that food production is not only something that concerns the rural areas, but food, food production and food consumption is also primarily now driven by urban areas. And that's why I'm very grateful to be able to announce our second speaker, uh, and Mimi, I hope you forgive me if I call you by your nickname. So Mimi Niyama, who from Food Agency Cape Town, who's with us today. And Mimi, without further ado, I'd like to give you the floor and a warm welcome to this panel. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Saneli Siwenyaba. Um, everyone calls me Mimi, so it's OK. Um, I am an artist. Um, I, I am a writer. Um, I, I'm a storyteller overall. Um, I come from the community of Mfuleni in Cape Town. Um, it definitely is not the Cape Town that when you Google Cape Town, you, you know, um, the, the mountain comes up, all these beautiful sites come up. Um, but the community that I represent is definitely on the margins of Cape Town. 
Um, and I come from this community and I, I, I am here today um, because I started on a journey um, of, uh, uh, I joined a co-research initiative um, with Humboldt University about last year where we were researching um, food, the effects of COVID-19 on food insecurities in the communities in Cape Town, which are Kailicha, Kukuletu, Mfuleni, um, St. Helena Bay. And yeah, I need to mention those, those names as well, because when we say Cape Town, we need to be more specific. Um, and this co-research initiative looked at food insecurities in, in, in this community. And um, what it did was look at these key issues and also look at key solutions with members of the community. And this is how my voice also came in. And um, one could easily say that if you were looking at research and um, you're looking at where I come from being raised from a single mom-headed family home, I, I, am a, I, I would have been a mere statistic in the sense that um, I'm, I'm black, I come from a poor background, I am a mom of two young children. Um, but what being here right now means that um, my voice and, my, and, and that of my community is being amplified. And um, when it comes to food security, there's also the question of nutrition and what food people can afford and the knowledge of the food that people can afford um, and whether or not they have a choice in accessing nutritious food, in accessing um, when we're thinking about sustainability and being able to access um, food that is sustainable. So there's a question of being able to access these and if these communities um, when they do get this, this, these opportunities to take part in solutions um, of, of food insecurities, can they exercise the freedom and the agency then to be able to say, no, I want the healthier option because it's more expensive. Um, and a lot of the time, these homes have people that do not work and do not have an income that will sustain this kind of lifestyle. So if we're questioning, uh, if we're questioning sustainability, we really have to allow everyone to be able to define what is sustainable, to be able to define what they feel is nutritious and healthy food. Um, and through these and through these uh, visions with communities, then we want to look to a future where we place um, solutions of food in our community at the center of other social ills, um, because you're not just dealing with food insecurity, you're dealing with a cultural breakdown within communities, um, where school children drop out of, of, of school, um, where the crime is high, um, where unemployment is high. Um, and I think my place as an artist and my place as a storyteller um, and other storytellers and other kinds of disciplines is to really also be able to contribute and take part um, in looking at these solutions of food insecurity, solutions of climate change, um, and to make them accessible within these communities. Um, I think I'm going to close there. Um, Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Mimi. And sorry, we will stay with your nickname because it's so lovely. But thank you for giving us this great uh, sto voice from the ground, you know, and just really mentioning that you could have been a statistic as well, but you have a voice and that's fantastic. And that's what I hope we will be doing today. So I'm going to give the next voice, a very able voice, uh, the platform now. And this is Faith Alube the executive, executive officer, chief executive officer of the Kenya Lands Alliance. She's a human rights lawyer and she's really involved in this struggle for also indigenous communities and so and women. So Faith, please give us a perspective from Kenya. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Wangu. Thank you very much to TMG and the organizers of this forum. Indeed, it's, it's, it's a great honor to be in this space. As Wangu has mentioned, my name is Faith Alube, and I have a passion for women and women land rights and land justice. So today I'm here to talk about um, indigenous women and why they are very vulnerable to the issue of climate change. So since I do land justice, I'll start from that point. Um, generally, when you're talking about land and the vulnerability of communities and indigenous communities to say, um, there are still unresolved historical land injustices that these communities have to deal with. There are issues of multiplicity of laws that these communities have to deal with. There are issues of underrepresentation in policy spaces that these communities have to deal with. If you look at all these challenges that the general communities have to deal with, and then now you focus on women, indigenous women in such uh, 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 situations or in that circumstances, their vulnerability then is it's even more compounded by the fact that the enforcement of the law is compromised when you're talking about the gap between policy and practice. The issue that most of them, uh, their literacy levels are very low. So when you're talking about climate change, they still do not understand how do they develop resilience when you're talking about climate change. They have traditional methods and traditional knowledge that they've used over the years like harvesting uh, rainwater, like keeping food for long so that they can use during drought. Uh, they have their own methods that they use. But when you're talking about climate change, there are policy languages that are still such a challenge to these indigenous women. Awareness of their rights is another issue. Thus, there are some officers or policy makers that take advantage of that and impart uh, decisions or they, they impose decisions. That is the word. They impose decisions on 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 on, on these women because you get that their their knowledge is limited. Their organization organizing they don't organize so well in order to be able to confront some of the issues that climate change has made them go through. The change of weather patterns, how they can be able to to deal and 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 take care of their 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 roles, women roles in. In, in, in a society. The issue of patriarchy and, and retrogressive culture is one of the things that really affects these women because we know most of them um, find identity in their cultural uh, um, in their cultural settings. They find validation in what they do as a community which works, but at times it works against them because the patriarchal and traditional way of dealing normally denies them the right of being in spaces where uh, they can be represented and their voices are amplified. And then the, the, the issue of, of not being able to connect the dots is also another driver of their vulnerability when talking about climate change. Like for instance, most of these policies, they do not understand, they are not involved uh, most of them, I, I, I don't think their voices are heard, and if they are heard, they're in the minority rather than the majority. You're know, talking about policy change and systems change. There are so many things we can do uh, when you talk about training and capacity building. Before even we go training and capacity building of these women, there's the issue of resource thin resources, um, who trains them, who, who, who cares um, if they know or they don't know. This, this, um, this conversation that is so macro, macro level, they do not understand it in their space, in their own language. So we're talking about indigenous women developing resilience. Yes, they have traditional knowledge, and yes, they might transfer it to the next generation, but there are some things that affect them and the discussion, the discourse is too high for them. The issue of knowledge and capacity is something that we need to invest more on. Because when you're talking about them being change agents, change agents have to be knowledge built in order to be able to be effective and confront some of the challenges that they are facing like the issue of patriarchy, like the pandemic that is ongoing, the threat to their economy and livelihoods, compromised livelihoods. They were so used to a certain way of life that climate change has threatened. There is need to help these women adapt. Uh, when you're looking about drivers, there is no gender disintegrated data. So when policymakers are making decisions, 
what informs them? Do they think that these women are homogeneous? Do they think that one community, what works in one context will be able to work in the other context? And as we talk about context, do they appreciate that some of these women cannot engage without being able to understand what the discussion is about in their own language, in their own spaces? And as I finalize, or I can continue, I'm not seeing a timer. Uh, so as we talk about drivers of change, it's important to know also tenure security issues for these women come up. In my country, 70% of our lands are communally held lands. Most of these indigenous women live in these lands. These lands for the longest time have generationally excluded women from decision-making spaces. So when you're talking about climate change, then you're talking about tenure security, then you're talking about resilience. These women have an idea that this is what we do because it's our role as women in this community, but they do not have that capacity to engage in that space without policy uh, change that is ongoing right now. But we are wondering, even if policy change is going on right now, in the far-flung areas, who informs them? If every other document is in English and, and the local Kiswahili, and some of these women never went to school, who cares to go to these far-flung areas and tell these women, you know what, these are your rights under policy. So such policies are good on paper, but they perpetuate the inequality that these women have been facing for the longest time. As I conclude, there's the issue of the intergenerational conversations that are very important in such contexts. Most of these women have traditional knowledge on how uh, to, 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 to develop resilience during droughts and how to pass the knowledge. Our constitution even protects the right uh, of indigenous communities to protect their biodiversity. But how then can we ensure that the younger generation is involved enough to also be able to learn this traditional uh, knowledge that the older women have? There is need for more resources. And in this, in this term, I'm using resources in terms of human capacity, knowledge, uh, simplified discussions that these women can be able to engage in, in their own spaces, in their own way. Lastly, before I forget, we develop policies in, 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 in these huge capital cities in the world. But who cares about the woman in Turkana? How does she see these policies? Because she's the primary right holder in most of these conversations. But who talks on her behalf? When you're talking about formalizing laws and formalizing their land tenure and telling them, you know, as women, you should be involved in decision making in their world, okay. they're doing what they can in their world. That's what they do. So we should bring down the conversation to be able to tell them, make it to those contexts. Thank Faith. you very much. <laughs> Faith, thank you very much. Uh, the passion speaks yeah. through you. So thank you very much for these very um, important and, and really pertinent points to the debate. And I know that when Kumi takes the, the floor later on, a lot of what you've said regarding the question not only of language, but also of forms of expression to really generate an exclusive, inclusive struggle for change. This is something that, that Kumi will also speak to later on. So these points are all well taken. I now have the, the pleasure to move to the inst more institutional perspective by uh, inviting Corinna Enders uh, to this debate. Corinna is the chief executive officer of ZUG. Those who are less familiar with German acronyms, it is um, agency in Germany that is responsible for the International Climate Initiative, one of um, the key initiatives globally to finance uh, climate adaptation. Corinna, thank you very much for freeing up your busy calendar and thank you very much for being with us. I'll hand over to you to speak to how Iki bridges the missing middle. Thank you for being with us. Yeah, thanks, uh, yes, um, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Um, first of all, I would like to thank TMG and uh, Robert Bosch Stiftung for organizing these events, and it's a great pleasure for me to contribute uh, to, the, to the discussion today. Um, I think we have already heard uh, very powerful statements on how the situation is, 
Um, uh, I would like to focus today um, on uh, the International Climate uh, uh, Initiative and what the Federal Ministry for Environment in Germany is doing to address some of these issues uh, we've uh, just heard. Let me uh, first uh, explain a focus uh, a bit more on the on the ICI, on the International Climate is Initiative, as I'm not sure if you all are familiar with this funding instrument. So um, the ICI is the most important instrument utilized by the BMU to support international climate action and biodiversity um, projects in developing, emerging, and transition countries. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the project selection goes through an idea competition in uh, thematic areas and country calls um, across uh, different priority areas. Um, up to date, the ICI has improved funding for more than uh, 700 climate and biodiversity projects in over 16 countries worldwide, with a tilting total funding volume of 4.5 billion euros between 28 and, and now. So the BMU supports, uh, or with the ICI, the BMU supports solutions, strategy, strategies, and seek to achieve a sustainable change. Um, uh, the ICI assists partner countries to implement their NDCs and to take an uh, ambition approach um, with regard to the Paris Agreement and uh, these measures uh, developing uh, measures for uh, includes also measures for adaptation and also resilience. Uh, when it comes to biodiversity, the ICI supports country partners in their efforts to achieve the targets uh, in the CBD. So that's more the overall approach of the ICI, but of course there are also a lot of uh, well, several principles and also requirements for, uh, the for, for funding, which I would like to highlight because I think it's, it's important for the discussion um, today. Um, and of course also the ICI is developing and we uh, improve uh, I think also the requirements, uh, the requirements for addressing and considering new findings of several projects. Um, first of all, uh, the involvement of the local sector. We have already heard that this is important, but I think the, the ICI is already acknowledging the importance of, of these level. So ICI projects combine actions in the national, the regional and the local level. So all these three levels are uh, represented. Then um, several ICI projects try to make uh, use of a bottom-up approach to feed practical local experience into national and then also, uh, of course, inter international decision-making processes and, and policies. Um, another uh, funding requirement I would like to highlight is that we expect in the project proposals this, that 50% of the funding is implemented through local actors in the cooperation countries. Um, this is how we would like to enable local communities and local, local actors. Um, then, and all, also then of course to, to uh, yeah, to use the local partners' technical and administrative skills um, uh, to develop uh, the, the project. Um, another very important issue for the ICI and also uh, and, uh, something which we think is important to bridge the gap is uh, the partnership between public and private sector and that this is, has to be addressed uh, even more. So a lot of projects um, uh, should contribute or the project should contribute to mobilizing private sector funding either by directly mobilizing private sector or by fostering conditions for the private sector. So uh, the ICI um, uh, strives for diversifying uh, funding approaches in, in uh, their, their pro projects. Um, Maybe some main findings from uh, projects. Uh, I would also like to highlight some uh, insights which can be drawn from uh, project examples. The contributions to achieve climate resilience um, must take place on many levels, as I said before. 
uh, strengthening the local level, but then also feed into national plans, uh, which then feeds into the uh, international uh, perspective. Um, the access to land and land use rights, uh, we think is very essential or essential factors to be considered um, in these pro projects. And as we have heard <laughs> uh, before, especially for disadvantaged or marginalized groups, uh, for example, indigenous people, women, and the rural poor. These factors, land use rights, are crucial to empower them to influence uh, an enabling environment. Um, Sorry. Yeah, these are maybe uh, a first insight of the ICI. Um, uh, I think we have to uh, identify more entry points uh, and approaches to accelerate, uh, accelerate the creation of climate resilient landscapes. Um, uh, I think uh, one important point for us, for, for the ICI, is also the ICI evaluation, where we really try to um, evaluate the projects also in a midterm uh, evaluation and then bring these uh, findings to the next level and to the next calls. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Corinna, and especially for picking up on some of those very strong statements that were made earlier and really trying to show what a first response should be or could be. And I think now to really kickstart the discussions in the panel, I want to just throw out a few words, a, key, a few key words I picked up in, in these discussions. I picked up the notion of being a statistic, almost an accidental uh, voice in a sense. You know, uh, Mimi told us, you know, like she could have been one of the statistics, you know, in terms of just where she comes from, you know, what she represents in terms of gender, and so on. And so I think one of the things that's really coming out very strongly is how do we make sure that we are not just accidental statistics, you know, either in terms of they find themselves with a voice or without a voice. So how can we be more intentional in how we involve people and bring their voices into the discussions? I think another strong voice uh, issue that came up was the fact that food, even in climate discussions, but food is very much at the heart of community and integration. And so in a sense, food insecurity then means the opposite of that. It's almost, it's a sign of breaking, you know, of, of just social capital getting lost and that food is at the center of that. So how do we bring in these perspectives into a discussion on climate resilience? Then we heard about the importance of connecting the dots, about linking these different spaces, you know, levels and so on. So who does that? Who, who is the one that's going to be the intermediary between all these levels? So a lot of issues for us to pick up on. And I think maybe what I will do, since it's a virtual session rather than us sitting at the table and making eye contact directly, maybe I will just ask that we go in the same order that we started and maybe just give you a quick response, you know, how do we bridge this missing middle from just some of the perspectives that came out? Professor Mbo, if you could just kick us off. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. And thank you colleagues for very refreshing ideas. But to respond to your question and to keep it short for, for my colleagues to come in, I think there is two things that we need to be mindful. These are two very important things. One is targeting. There is no genuine solutions. There is no food systems that can apply everywhere. At least we can consider there are several food systems across the globe. Every single area of geography with different culture, different ecologies and, 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 and aspirations, which is absolutely central. I can get it from face presentation and from uh, in Mrs. Nyaba presentation. Food is the most cultural thing. It's the fundamental difference between eating and feeding yourself. The fact of, of getting food is a cultural thing. We all know it. When we travel abroad, when you go to Cape Town, your city, or I was just in France, I was looking for African restaurant. Uh, you know, an American will look for an American restaurant. We all have some kind of cultural relationship on what we do. It's the way we dress, the way we eat, are one of the most cultural things. As a Senegalese, I'm well in place to tell you that if there is a city with no Chebujian, I would likely starve during my stay. So this is absolutely fundamental. And targeting will connect you with the aspiration. But it's beyond that. Targeting will help you respond to the, ge the geographical requirements 
and of the food system we produce. I'm writing for the African Union and a, a kind of book chapter on, on food systems in Africa. And I realized that the highland agriculture, the, the, the Congo Basin agriculture, the semi-arid agriculture, the riverside agriculture, there's so many different systems that are in place that needs specific solutions. The second prong, this is targeting. The second prong is partnership. We all mentioned, Iki cannot just rise if there is no strong partnership between different people. Adaptation is not just one, one entry point. There are several entry points. And the issue of co-design I mentioned earlier requires strong partnership. And partnership is not just playing with big institutions. We forget sometimes when we look for partners to look for the local NGOs, the local community associations, the few influencers, the champions at the village who can help extend our influence on that village to improve food system. Often they are taken off the loop and we think partnership is go to United Nations institutions, big institutions such as mine, but the action and the impact we need to have require partnership at local level. Over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mimi, please. Um, hi. Um, so I, I, I think the, the really what um, I, I will continue from this um, from this perspective of of, of, of 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 seeing myself sort of especially being involved in this um, in, in this co research um, is um, we also need to find ways to so to 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 break down and mine the information that is being generated in order to be able to um, to, 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 to engage with it within communities. Um, so there's definitely also the issue of language. Um, I think the issue of representing knowledge, um, it doesn't necessarily just have to come in writing, it can come in, in photographic um, representation, it can, it can come in podcast. Um, and I, I really also love um, the the touching on um, on, on culture um, and just looking at food as 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 being so central um, to 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 our cultural practices. Um, I know that if you go to an event and you don't eat, you don't you're, you are not fed or you are fed late or you are fed too little. It really changes the perception of how you experience. Um, um, and that particular event, um, yeah, I think uh, that that's the the one thing is is really trying to merge, um, for example, research um, and 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 art and um, empowering sort of the different voices uh, within community, especially the knowledge systems um, and knowledge practices in communities, so that we can really. Uh, when we start to imagine a future, uh, you know, when we start to engage um, a, 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 w with people through music, um, through um, just you, that reimagination or exercising sort of that, um, th that knowledge or discussing a topic really opens up more room to be able to um, think about the future differently. I think we really need to to, to do that. Thank you so much. Very much. Uh, Faith, please continue. Thank you very much, uh, Wango. Um, in addition to what my colleagues have said, we have to look at um, climate change and indigenous women and the whole discussion from an intersectionality lens. Um, it cannot be. It cannot stand alone. There are other interlinking rights that have to be to be looked at as well. When you're talking about food systems, there's a tenure security question. There is the availability of of information, resourcing. How can all these rights be interlinked to a, um, a degree or to a level where the right holder? actually understands the discussion and, and becomes a driver of change. And then the issue of technology. Uh, right now, that is where the world is going to. But some of these people are so disadvantaged. You're talking about uh, uh, technology. Um, my colleague even mentioned the, the PPP. Uh, some of the PPPs actually are perpetrators of impunity. And I dare say that because they take advantage of the lack of knowledge and the, and, 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 and the lack of clarity in some of the policies. 
to, to perpetuate impunity in some, in some circumstances. So as we talk about uh, 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 rights, because these are justice questions from where I sit. As we talk about uh, how then do we ensure that the right holders are not uh, inconvenienced, uh, that, that the discussion and the discourse, the way we understand it, causes them harm. We have to move together. The, the, the duty bearers and the right holders have to move together. That means having a conversation that every other stakeholder understands and can act on it. So that when we are developing these this big documents, we should also remember that they have to be evidence-based in order for the right holder to appreciate it. And as I conclude, the issue of data, um, we cannot be winning decision-making. It has to be based on something. When, when, when you talk about this number of women, we've increased the number of indigenous women who, for instance, have tenure security in certain contexts. Based on what? How do we measure the milestones? And how, we do, how do we make these women appreciate such discussions from the milestones that are measurable? Thank you very much, Juan. We don't want to ask you to respond, but please, you know, just continue the reflection, please. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me first come to, to the issue of food. I think we should also mention that um, is it uh, what is the system of agriculture we have at the moment? And uh, because I think we need a sustainable agriculture, which takes into account also the ecosystem and the, 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 the biodiversity uh, we have at the moment. So this is very important and linked uh, to, to the feed, uh, food issue. Um, then uh, maybe a, a few words on, on partnerships. Of course, we need international partnerships, but I fully agree we need um, also the partnerships then uh, up to, 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 the, to the local level. And I mean, I, uh, uh, you mentioned before also uh, not only the culture, also the language. And I mean, I used to live in Kenya. I know that a uh, Turkana woman <laughs> doesn't understand English. <laughs> so it is... This is something we have to take into account the specific of the countries and the specifics of the of the regional needs uh, when it comes to, uh, when it comes down to to to, to the local uh, level. And the, the, the main thing is then how we um, how can we come to these voices and how can we listen to these voices in their own language and to bring them uh, then to the to the regional level and then up to the national level and then of course uh, back to to the international level. That uh, that I think is key uh, for um, the success of uh, of all these projects. Uh, we yeah we would like to support and and fund. Thank you. Thank you. Before I hand over to uh, our dear colleague Alexander, I think I would, would uh, ask the panel to please respond briefly to a question that, that arose while listening to you. In the beginning, we had set out the question, how do we address this implementation gap? How do we create an enabling environment? How do we actually overcome uh, this missing middle that we have described? And I think you've all spoken to various extent uh, to the question of how to actually empower agency. I think this is a term that, that Mimi had coined. And I think I'd like to build on that. From what you've just heard, how, what I would be, from your point of view, what are examples where strengthening agency, empowering agency in your professional life so far had actually worked? What are these, these cautionary tales of optimism that you would like to share uh, for strengthening uh, agency? And I will think I'll stick to the same order. Professor Mbo, please uh, go first. Uh, thank you. Thank you, yes. Um, thank you. This is a very difficult question, yes, you know it. And it's, it's something which is not specific to the continent of Africa, it's everywhere. There is two hunch which I want to share with you. First of all, most of the solutions we are talking about to improve the implementation are not in any policies in our governments. There is no sustainable agriculture ministry. There is no agroforestry ministry. There is no sustainable intensification ministry. There is no agroecological ministry. So if we don't have a specific dedicated institutions to move this agenda forward, how can we derive the level of investment in that countries to create the set of transformation we want? 
In other words, what I'm saying is we will keep using those concepts and we will keep relying on foreign aid to invest into those areas. But as long as the national countries does not put those things in the core of their business and policies, the set of tra transformation will not happen. We will be doing tinkering, but we will not be working on transformation. The second one prong is about opportunities. What are the opportunities of trying to improve our food system? And one opportunity in Africa is to go beyond the, the set of five crops that are in all the food security reports. Maize, wheat, um, we know it. Those five things, sorghum. But Africa has over 100 species which yield fruits, grains, oil, food nutritious product. That is now things you see in Europe. Um, the good drink on baobab fruits, you find it in Germany. I was in Nuremberg in a PhD defense. They serve me baobab uh, fresh juice. You go in the US, uh, so people will, will sell you, uh, you know, uh, fonion as a cereal with no gluten, extremely good for health. Those neglected plants are developed in, in areas where the practice to develop them is neglected themselves. So the opportunity to create transformation is to look at this neglection. What is neglected? What is the species which are neglected? What are the practices that we have been forgotten? And hold them back in the system and invest heavily on those processes. There's a great deal of solutions that we are revisiting now in Africa, which have been our ancestors' practice. They know how to do diversification, multifunctional landscape, uh, agrobiodiversity, because the same piece of land was serving for the good, for water, for wood fuel, for soil, for, for, for everything. So with the monoculture and the speciation that comes with colonial system, we tend to do cultivation the same way European does, and it does not adapt to our needs. And that's things I think which we need to rethink to improve the implementation gap. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Professor Ambo. So the policies as well as the opportunities slash technologies that are both culturally rooted as well as potentially well better adapted to, to, to climate change. Um, Mimi, policies, opportunity technologies, what is your contribution to the discussion on, on strengthening agency? Um, you know, um, I, I am, my, mo my mother is a, is a farmer. Um, and um, the, before she, she got into farming, um, I, I mean, we had, we would find different ways to sort of um, find, to, to find food. And the one thing that, um, the one thing that really empowered her, which in turn empowered me, is that ability to sort of um, grow your own food. And this has sort of led me to, to, to find myself in this space right now. Um, and I think when we really, uh, when, I, when I think about agency, I'm, I'm really going to try to, to sort of try and sort of personalize this because it's really the only way I can read it right now. Um, being a part of the, this um, sort of this code research um, has allowed me, and I think also my, my background in, 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 in studying social sciences, and as much as I come from um, a poor background, and I come from, a, I was at a disadvantage, um, and also at some point I was unemployed for, for I think three, three or four years after I graduated, I was able to see myself as an, as an individual who was struggling with this, but I was also able to really see myself within the collective of, I was not necessarily the only one that was struggling. Um, so it, it, it's not really a me issue, but rather a collective issue. And then now that um, I'm, I'm in the space um, and I, I am learning these new terms and I'm learning to talk about policies, um, the, the, the one, and I'm learning to talk about, uh, about policies is that um, through our podcast, um, and, and through um, community dialogues, um, we are able to then even come to question policies or things, and, and policy is not something that we necessarily talk about every day or, or we have access to or we have an influence over. 
Um, and, and I think the more we do, we, the more we do talk about it, and the more we do um, engage with with this uh, with these topics, is really the more we can then become agents from the ground root, from the grassroots. <laughs> from we can become agents from the grassroots and sort of influence um, the the food system. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mimi. I would suppose, Faith, if I turn to you, that the whole question of identity, collective identity, and what is it that we consider to be possible as an individual is probably something that, that would speak to you when it's about creating agency. Thank you very much. Yes, there's need for uh, the right holders to own their struggle, and and as we understand, most of the uh, of the of the people that actually right holders on land, land is a form of identity, a cultural uh, um, um, a cultural asset that that is the only intergenerational gift that uh, people in my country can hand over to the next generation. So when you're talking about policies, we should focus on the gender disparities in most of these communities. We should, as 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 people who come in to support to support uh, 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 these communities. We should not ignore the fact that most of these uh, communities might not understand some of that language we use, but we should not cause more harm. As a lawyer, I just like to say that the law is good, policies are good, but multiplicity of laws become a barrier when a community has to, to understand 10 pieces of legislation to claim one entitlement. We have to find a way to ensure that the policies are good, but they should not become a bottleneck to communities to access justice. And I'll give an example. An indigenous community in Kenya, they have to be aware of their rights over their land and territories from the colonial level. Okay. Um, Apologies again, um, and I think although it is a rather abrupt end to the previous panel discussion, uh, I think uh, to make up for the time uh, that we lost and to not eat too much into the, to the next panel discussion, I think I would like to hand over to Alexander for his recap of the, of the first panel and to build the bridge and then Wangu will start facilitating the, the second panel. Again, I, I beg your pardon. Uh, for the for the mishaps that occurred. Alexander, over to you. Welcome back to all the participants, and f especially thanks for coming back. Seems that you are really interested in the debate, and therefore we really appreciate it. I would like to try now to provide an interim summary of the debate we had in the first panel. And of course, I would like to start with thanking all the panelists for really having unfolded the complexity of how to adapt the various and different food systems of the world to changing climatic conditions. I would like to draw five plus one conclusions, five conclusions from the panel, and I would like to add an additional thought to it. So my, my first conclusion, we all know it, but it has to be stated again and again. Climate change is a multiplier of already existing risks and it adds new challenges, new diseases, new spreads of diseases. And therefore, wherever we have a problem in the food chain today, it might get worse tomorrow. We have to know it. Climate change is putting additional burden on food systems. And we, from the global north, are responsible for climate change. It's our emissions having a negative impact on the livelihoods of the poorest and small-scale farmers in developing countries, and therefore we have a historical liability. We have to support, we have to finance, we have to collaborate, we have to cooperate. My second comment is, and we've heard it from different panelists, food systems are incredibly complex. If someone thinks that adaptation of the energy system to climate change is a challenge, he or she does not fully understand the complexity of food systems. 
Food systems start with our natural resource bases, soils, water, temperature, but they go over agricultural practices to processing, distribution to the households, and to the question is, what can we eat in future and what is available? And therefore, we have to look at the complexity, and as one of the panelists said, we need a targeted approach. There is no silver bullet, and we have to recognize that we do not have only different agroecological systems in the world, but we also have very different cultures. And both agroecological systems and the different cultures, they are an asset. They create the wealth of our food systems. It's very, I think it's very good that we have these different food systems. But let us not forget that, especially in Africa, many food systems are based on informal relations. It is not supermarkets only in cities, it's informal markets. It's small scale producers bringing their food to the city, marketing it. Uh, there is a lot of informal value creation. And let us not forget that these informal vendors, these informal farmers, they also need support for adaptation. Let us not look at the official uh, channels only. And therefore, my third, comment is when we are talking about the implementation gap, we are talking about institutions, capacity building, funding, we are talking about technology, appropriate research. These all are parts of a system that has to support change. Because what the climate crisis is going to do is it will change the whole food system, as I try to explain. And therefore, we have to find a way to create an enabling environment so that farmers, vendors, people buying and, and, and cooking food, that they can adapt to these changing climatic conditions. This means that we have to organize it. The markets alone are not going to provide the agency we need. They are not going to provide the direction we need. And therefore, it is very clear that adaptation to changing climatic conditions, they have to achieve multiple benefits in agriculture, in the food chain, and therefore, we have to look at the whole complexity. For me, it was really important to see that panelists were referring to the question of land tenure. We know that land tenure today is very often a challenge insecure tenure rights, insecure secondary rights. And with climate change, these tenure rights might become even more fragile because climate change is devaluating some of the, 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 the soils and, and therefore it might come to migration. So we have to look at the whole package and we have to organize it. My comment number four is that this complex process can only be organized if we bring all stakeholders together. It requires, it is a must that civil society, civil society with their knowledge, with their voices from the ground, with their inconvenience sometimes to really raise the, the, the topics, that they have to be integrated. And for me, this is one of the big problems of the United Nations food systems they have made a big mistake for not integrating sufficiently civil society organizations. So we need all stakeholders, but the voices from the ground, the representatives of the poorest and the most vulnerable have to play a key role. And when they are inconvenient, they have a very good reason for it because they making us aware what is not working today and where the problems will become bigger tomorrow. So based on the challenges we have received also information about what is going to work. Where do we know that adaptation strategy already have created benefits? Agroforestry, agroecology has been mentioned. This means that we need a dedicated research strategy bringing together all forms of knowledge. We need scientific knowledge, but also the knowledge of indigenous people in order to be able to tackle the complex challenges of climate change. My item number five is a very simple one. We want 
farmers, food producers, vendors to adapt to an uncertain future. If we are really honest, we do not really know if the climate crisis will bring more rain or more drought in a region. It might alter. In one year you have a flood, in next year you might have a drought. And therefore being prepared for the unknown requires clear safety nets. And the right to food, which has been adopted several decades ago and where all member countries of the United Nations have agreed on how to implement it, has to serve as a safeguard so that farmers and informal renters and poor people in cities can rely that the uncertainty they are facing and that the challenges they are working on and that the new topics they have to tackle, that they will have a social safeguard system in place which has been internationally agreed. This is the right to food. Now I would like to add something which I think is really important when we are talking about the future challenges. We are talking about the climate crisis as a challenge having started today and it will continue tomorrow. But let us not forget that there's a second crisis going on, the COVID crisis. And I'm convinced that we have to learn the lessons from this COVID crisis because the COVID crisis has again and again unveiled the inequalities and the injustice. There is no global governance system that ensures that everybody in the world can get a vaccine, that everybody can get the appropriate treatment. And if we are looking at the current situation and if we are comparing it to the challenges in the food system, I'm convinced that we need a strong governance approach so that we do not only learn the lessons, but also be prepared for the challenges to come. This is my interim conclusion from the rich discussion in the panel. And I would like to hand over to you, Yes and Wangu, to open now the second part of our meeting. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Alexander. And um, because we are trying to make up for some of the lost time, again, our apologies to everybody who was bumped off and also really to our speakers in the second panel who have had to then join a bit later. But we hope you're all there and we're really looking forward to kickstarting again our very rich discussion. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Yuba Sokona, who is a special advisor with the South Center in in, the, in Switzerland and also has long-standing experience with the in international panel, uh, advisory panel on climate change. And we're just going to ask him in the same way that we framed the food systems discussions in the first panel to just help us understand a little bit from that sort of expert perspective, IPCC perspective, how do land, food and climate link up and how can we use this intersectional lens to really look at transformative, more transformative partnerships between Africa and Europe. Thank you, Mr. Sokona. Okay, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to take part to this uh, very important conversation. And there is some, uh, you know, beauty on uh, uh, the new mode of communication of uh, the virtual. At the same time, we are facing some problem, technical problem that is inherently related to that. I, I think first of all, land, food, climate, each are very complicated and complex issues. If you comp say you, you look at them separately, and then the problem will get much more complex and complicated if you bring them together, in particularly in the African context, uh, there is no way you can separate food, land, and climate issues. And then it's where the, you will see the reality, the situation in the African context. And in order to address your question, I think that uh, from the discussion that just uh, finished, and there is uh, three main issues, three main clusters in the African context. That, that's related to everywhere in the world, but it's much more in African context those clusters are uh, dealing with those issues in silos. The first cluster is a policy cluster, and then from the local to the regional to the national level. 
And then the second cluster is the knowledge cluster is much more fragmented because we have different knowledge systems. And then we have the uh, local knowledge system or the traditional knowledge system and we have the uh, modern model. And then the uh, third cluster is the practitioner. And that is from individual, from a farmer, herder, a private entity or community-based So each of them are working in uh, a fragmented way with no interaction between them. And then we all know that more and more, and this is how we came up with a various uh, solution space in a climate and to explore to them, that there is a need of frequent interaction between those three different clusters. And fortunately, in the African context, there's no interaction between them. They are completely separated. And then the, the, the one who is much more fragmented is the knowledge cluster. And then the traditional one is completely separated and then the other. And I think that this is fundamental issue. We need to bring those different elements. And then is from that perspective, it's needed to have an appropriate governance and institutional systems that are critical and fundamental, unless you bring those different things. But in that context, the gap and then the weaknesses of those is supported by the so-called project. Because the project will never replace the governance and institutional deficiencies that exist, but no one is addressing those different issues. And then we have the tendency to look at the product rather than the process, as the process as important than the product. And I think that this is very important and then to look at. The second element is related to the inclusive governance that is critical. And then from the local to the uh, national and the other, because issues we are dealing with, it is not one off issue, it's an ongoing process. So that that means that the process is as important, very important because we are not finishing with the climate issue, we are not finishing the land issue, we are not finishing the... And then things get much more complicated in the African context that one issue related to land, related to agriculture, related to the climate, is the issue of firewood and charcoal. And that made the problem much more complicated. That has devastating impact on food security because and then the, the food system, and then the actual system is a run-fed system with limited input. And I think that those are uh, some of the issues we really need to look at. And there is some discussion, some of the questions are related to the partnership. And uh, I have some reservation on the partnership issue. I would rather say solidarity. And then that makes much, uh, uh, much more sense than partnership. And uh, the summary of the previous uh, uh, panel indicated that uh, we need to learn lessons from the, uh, the, the COVID. And then one of the missing problems, one of the missing issues uh, of the COVID is the solidarity, lack of solidarity. And I think that if you want to address this fundamental issue, and then we need to bring in the solidarity rather than partnership, because partnership means there is no partnership between the you know, the African farmer and the European farmer, there could be solidarity. Solidarity, and then the big difference is that I know I am much more stronger than you. I am much more powerful than you. We collectively take your problem as our concern and under your leadership, we'll find solutions. It is not a preconceived idea from outside to say that this is what's good for you, I bring it to you. And then those are some of the if uh, 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 some of the element I just want to bring in in order to stimulate the discussion. Sorry to be too long. I think that is much more an interaction that's much more important than me talking. Thank you. Thank thank you very much, Yuba, and thank you very much for for closing on this uh, very strong note of um, the important term of solidarity. And I'm sure by knowing who's going to speak. Uh, in the following, I think this is something that will definitely be, be taken up by others. Um, I would now I would like to give the floor to, to Susan Chomba. Susan is the Director of Vital Landscapes 
at WRI Africa. I'm somehow uh, inclined to make stupid jokes about bringing vital digital landscapes to the digital desert Germany. I will not do it now, but rather, uh, without further ado, hand it uh, over to you. Well, welcome and thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, thank you so much, yes, and thank you so much for this invitation. There are a few things I'd like to recap just before I get to the main point about the overall space that agriculture and food systems um, is in the global perspective. First of all, that we need to recognize food systems are responsible for at least a third of global greenhouse gas emissions. So we know the figure that is quoted about 24%, but if you look at the entire food value chain from farm to fork, we're talking about a third of greenhouse gas emissions. Secondly, food systems are responsible for catastrophic biodiversity loss, and that's especially on the African continent, where we are seeing increase in productivity is more related to um, you know, extending the area. So practices like shifting cultivation, where farmers, once they, pr once they produce food in a certain area and there's decline in terms of productivity, they shift to a new area, which normally is a forest, a new forest area that is opened. Sometimes if you have long fallow periods, this, this practice can be sustainable, but where you have short fallow periods and increasing population, then the practice is becoming increasingly unsustainable. Third, that um, you know, food systems, in terms of biodiversity loss, is also an angle of environmental pollution, where at least 64% of agriculture land is at risk of pesticide pollution. And that I've not added other sides, fungicides, herbicides, I've just talk talked about pesticides. And so, and then on top of that, is that food systems are leading to huge amount of social inequities. We've heard from the first panel about lack of access of food to indigenous communities, people in arid and semi-arid areas, women, youth groups, and other you know, marginalized groups that you'll find, even though we might be producing sufficient food in a certain area, not everybody is able to access that. So we are having the latest FAO report shows at least we have about between 700 to 800 million people who are going to bed hungry. And on top of that, at least over 200 million of those are found in Africa. So really our food system needs a total overhaul. And that total overhaul, I dare to say, is going to require a different kind of thinking. So what do we need to do? You asked me to look at, um, at, at, at what we need to do in terms of uh, addressing the missing middle. First of all, to recognize that uh, what Professor Sheikh Mbao mentioned that we, despite the best of efforts in terms of reducing emissions, the sixth IPCC report shows that we are going to at least in, you know, realize increasing global temperatures. And this is going to be, on average in Africa, it's higher than the global averages, the surface temperatures. And that means no matter what you do, we are going to see adverse effects. We are already seeing adverse effects on, on productivity as a result of climate change. And secondly, that, um, despite the best efforts, we see that the IPCC report also shows that we are likely to hit the 1.5 degrees Celsius in the next two decades. So there has to be, we have to realize that that is going to have a huge effect on the food systems, on our productivity, on crops, in terms of which crops are going to be growing where in the next uh, you know, few decades. So we can't transform the food systems with a stagnant mind. We have to think, what is going to happen ahead and how can we help our farmers to rapidly adapt and shift uh, our systems to be able to adapt to a rapidly changing climate. So four key things that need to happen. First one, we cannot, we cannot focus on adaptation without emphasizing the need for uh, cutting greenhouse gas emissions. That's important because no matter how much we build on adaptation, no matter how much we help our local communities, if the greenhouse gas emission trajectory continues, then we are going to find our farmers and farming systems at increasing vulnerability. So that's primary. And secondly, we need to invest in finance for adaptation. I dare to say that you know, the, 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 the global community and especially the developed world, this one is somewhere, this is somewhere we have really performed dismally. You know very well under the Copenhagen, uh, at the COP15 uh, you know, agreement, uh, you know, developed countries promised at least $100 billion a year for adaptation finance. How much of that has been realized up until now? Very, very little. And even worse, how much of that is actually reaching the vulnerable communities on the ground? A, a drop, if at all there is. So really, it's not just increasing. We need to increase the finance for adaptation. 
but we need to ensure that it reaches the local communities and the people who are most vulnerable. And that I don't see as realizing using our traditional methods of fund transfer, using the current methods of transfer. This is an area that we can really be innovative in terms of uh, innovations in, in, in fi finance mechanisms. For instance, I'll give an, an example. In a country like Kenya, we see a lot of people even in rural communities having mobile phone and mobile money access. Why is it so difficult, for instance, to be able to transmit adaptation finance to local communities through the technologies that we have? Why do we have to pretend that it has to go through very difficult bureaucracies with all kind of indirect costs and all kind of tape, red tape that comes with it? It reaches to farmer when it's very little and it's very late to do anything. So we need to be genuine and say we need transformative thinking in terms of adaptation finance if we want it to, re to realize what needs to happen. So a third, the third aspect, so I mentioned about greenhouse gas emission reductions, innovative finance, and the third one that, that really ties it, it, it's an aspect of research and conducting research that is going to be meaningful. It's not just research because we want to develop a fantastic papers and get citations. I'm a scientist. I know the thrills that we get with it when a paper is accepted in a journal and it is published and you get a lot of citations. But the impact of our research is going to be based on what it is generating at the local level. How much are we? How much is our knowledge uh, really going, generating enough actions that is generating new knowledge for action or that is changing policy? So that is going to be where we want to focus on research as researchers, and especially in areas that I mentioned. For now, for Africa, I've been saying at WRI World Resources Institute where I work, we are really pushing the boundaries in terms of thinking, what kind of modern tools can we be able to apply to see this kind of food system transitions depending on different climate scenarios for Africa? And that is going to be prerequisite. Last but not least, because I know I have short time, is the aspect of sub-national policies. A lot of people say, oh, we need policies. A lot of places are work, we don't have a shortage of policies. We have desegregated policies, a policy that is for agriculture that does not speak to environment, a policy for environment that does not speak to finance, a policy for, a policy for finance that does not. We need to be able to have integrated frameworks and policies that are not just at the national level, but also at subnational and local levels. So that's the missing middle, yes, that we've been talking about. That at the national level, there are a lot of policies in a lot of countries. In a country like Kenya, we don't have shortages of policy. But whether those policies are translating to the kind of changes that we want on the ground is really dependent on where the policies are formulated, who's involved, and whether we are then being able to implement those policies. So I'd like to just <laughs> pause there, yes, and say I'm really, really interested in this discussion. And thank you so much for the invitation. And thank you very much for this very passionate uh, statement for really speaking to uh, the question of how to capture and what is needed to close the, the, this missing middle. Um, yeah, thank you. And uh, unfortunately, one of our uh, panelists has been unable to join us. We hope he was also not a victim of this missing middle in terms of the technology. So we're going to jump right to Antoine Auger, who is with the Institute for European and with the Institute for European Environmental Policy. My apologies for getting that wrong. And we've heard a whole barrage of, of suggestions, of disconnections, and you know, and yeah innovative ideas that have been proposed. You know, is European policy up to the job? What, what, what is your take? Good afternoon, well, thank you very much for your, for your invitations. And indeed, with this, all the concepts that we've heard this afternoon are extremely important at the moment. I, I note, just as a bit of a context, I note some words that were announced a bit earlier from Alexander, for instance, who mentioned that the global north in general and the EU in particular has a responsibility as to the current situation. And this needs to be, uh, all policies that are developed needs to take this into account. That's over something job number one. And also based on what Susan has just said, I agree that financing is at the heart of it. Promises were made, agreements were reached on financing. And this now needs to be translated into uh, actions. And the cooperation policies of the EU are one of the way to go into that direction, hopefully, should there actually be designed in such a way that they allow this transformative um, effect. So at the moment, on the EU cooperation policy, we face kind of a bit of change in the in context rule, you know, as until recently, the relationship between EU 
And so in Africa was mostly regulated through the Cotonou Agreement in terms of cooperation, and we have now moved past toward a new financing uh, cooperation, which is more regionalized, so which could answer into this uh, need for target targeting the cooperation policies that have been mentioned. So this is an interesting um, development. And also is putting a lot of accents on leveraging, much more than before, on leveraging private funds, on leveraging investment, sustainable investment, and so on, which is also very important when it comes to financing, you know, because public funds on their own won't reach, to, won't make it up to the task. The leverage of private funds is also an interesting um, aspect. And this brings me to the point that I also wanted to make. All these cooperation policies at the moment, we are in the new context, as I just said, but we lack this uh, revolution that is needed to make sure that um, intermediary forces, local governments, local communities, MSMEs, small producers, farmers, all these um, populations are actually involved in, the, in this cooperation policy. So far, the great principle have been mentioned. And again, as I said, in this new context, there are some steps in the right direction, and yet, we need to have these populations taken into the into the mix. So far, what happens is that what happens is that we have discussion at the continental level between the EU and African Union. And then it goes down to the regional level, and then perhaps to the national level for the indicative program for the, all these cooperation policies that are put in place by one the EU funds. And then it comes to individual projects and programs for cooperation, which is which is very good because this could answer to these targeted needs. However, the population that we've just mentioned, farmers, indigenous women also, of course, they're never involved in the design of these policies. They are receivers. They are receivers of these cooperation policies. And how could they feel involved then? How, this, how could this policy be considered inclusive when they are not including the, most of the population that they intend to support from the, from the beginning? So this population should be initiators, not receivers of this, uh, of this uh, cooperation policy. And that is something that so far is missing in, from the EU, from the EU perspective. We need, so yeah, so I, will, I would like to maybe stop, stop there for the moment, but I will have more to say in the, in the remaining of the conversation, I'm sure. Thank you, Antoine. Uh, and I think uh, you were speaking about revolution uh, Yuba was starting with speaking about solidarity, so I, I see a certain uh, direction <laughs> here in the panel. No, but seriously speaking, I think it's a question that I had, uh, we had flagged in, in our first event to really ask, and this is a question that I would like to give to all three panelists, what have been movements, to not use the term partnerships, that actually managed to, to work together um, in solidarity to really address these the challenges that we have uh, discussed. And I think, uh, Yuba, I would like to, to begin with you. Can you give us an example where you, in your professional experience, have found a moment where this m movement of solidarity that you requested actually took place? I, I think that the it has to start first of all at national level and um, as we indicated there is a fragmentation and then all the challenges the problem we are facing actually being climate or being food security issue being uh, covid all are you know cross sectorial you know we cannot look at the silos and then the, the problem has to start at national level and at the national level, as I indicated, we need to bring together the three clusters that are not interacting at all. This is the policy cluster, the practice cluster, and the knowledge cluster. And then the policy at different levels. It is not only at, uh, and then the, the knowledge also, we have to look at the various knowledge systems. And as uh, Shekmo indicated, and then uh, particularly, uh, sometimes I just, you know, uh, I ask some of the younger uh, Malian who has less than 40 years, I just joke with them. I said, that, okay, I have 
prove 200 uh, US. Anyone who can give me the name of 10 local fruits, believe me or not, none of them are capable to do it. And then as Shekmbo indicated, most of those fruits have a lot of nutrition value. And then they have also restoring land and different other issues. And then they can easily talk about apple uh, pears and all, some other. Uh, or, 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 or. And then and, and this is very important and to have that, that, that level at national level. If there is a connection, and then so that at international level, it's much more easier and then to do it. But unfortunately, we are living in a system that uh, being it's 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 the expert international being bilateral multilateral they know what is good for those people there, and then they come up with ready made solutions, and then even if it's not adapted to the, the the context of the situation, and then you know the European way of living, or American way of living on Chinese, it is not the aspiration of the Africans, and then they do, they have to define and then they have also to articulate their own food system, their own way of living, if they have the opportunity to do that. And this is why I said that the solidarity means you came with humility and then you said that I will give you the support you need it, but you are the one who are in a driving seat. Uh, okay. So, uh, Susan, would you, may I ask you to pick up on what uh, Yuba has just said? From your experience, have you sort of, can you give us, can you share an example where this national local leadership was combined with meaningful support by, uh, let's say, uh, European organizations or other organizations to really, to really support these processes in solidarity as, as Yuba has, has called them? First of all, brilliant point there, Yuba, um, in terms of really recognizing that a food systems transformation in Africa needs to be led by Africans and they need to be at the front seat, whether it's the researchers, the policy makers, the local communities, it's extremely important. This is what we are talking about, just transitions. Uh, unfortunately, I think there's a lot of interest, um, divergent interests that play out on the continent. And, and we need to be cognizant of those and take a step back and say, are the models that we are pushing sustainable and going to take local ownership and root? So yes, your question. In terms of, I'll divert a little bit away from food and maybe make a reference to an area of work that I have been working on for years and that is at the core of my heart and that's on uh, land uh, restoration and maybe you, but if you're from Mali or from the Sahel, you'll be very, very much familiar with the uh, regreening of the Zinda and Maradi regions in Niger where you have over 5 million hectares uh, completely regreened by local communities in a context where we expect that when we see the Sahel, we see dry landscapes, we see areas that are very, very difficult to regreen. And that model to me speaks to what we are looking for, a model that is community-led, a model that, that really defies even policy. In fact, uh, some of the researchers that we've been involved in that on farmer managed natural regeneration or use of uh, uh, assisted natural regeneration in that region, what we found is actually the absence of um, implementing policies that would constrain farmers. So when, when, when the agencies that would uh, enforce policies that would be uh, antagonistic with farmers, when they actually don't do it, when just they let communities do what they know they, to do best, they restored those areas. Of course, there was support from uh, external actors that really natural regeneration or assisted natural regeneration was really a community-led uh, movement. And it shows that it is possible to achieve what everybody is looking for, elusive aspect of scale. Everybody asks me, okay, this is a very good technology, for instance, in agriculture in this, but how do you scale up? And I like to refer people to that where you have community-led, you have uh, policies, if the policies are not supporting communities, if they are not implemented, communities just thrive. But if you have supportive policies, then they should be implemented to support local communities. And then you have national government actors and international communities providing what we call really the lift, providing the, the technical support where it's needed, providing the funding when it's needed, but communities really leading it from the forefront. So let me stop there. Uh, yes, but that is an example that really talks to me about not just successful restoration, but also aspect of scale. 
Okay, uh, Susan, uh, Antoine, I'll, I'll give you the word uh, afterwards, but here's a question by one of our participants directed at you. That's why I'll, I'll stick with you. Um, and I think the question of our viewer refers to the question whether you can give an example how different sectors in the process that you've described, how also different sectors uh, can be brought together to address the multiplicity of policies that you reflect before. So I think the answer to yes is really understanding what we mean by participatory approaches. Participatory approaches and what we mean by meaningful participation of the different stakeholders. We need to understand in a landscape who's the different stakeholders and what stake do they bring to the table. So in that particular context that I gave, we know that the knowledge rested with the communities, the rights, the ability to do the work rested with the communities, but also the power, the legal power rested with the state agencies and we had the funding that came from uh, 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 development partners. So really, it, 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 it's understanding those kind of power dynamics, who's bringing what stake, and ensuring there's meaningful participation in the process. It's not an aspect of counting. We had five women on the table. We had five men, and so the process was, was participatory. That's what we call feigning participation or false participation, because it's an aspect of understanding the power dynamics, the role of the different actors and what they bring to the table, and ensuring there's a joint vision, there's a common vision of what needs to be achieved. So I hope I got that question right, yes, but I'd say those are the kind of ingredients and, and sort of the, the ingredients to the sauce of realizing meaningful participation and realizing a, trans, a transformation that includes all the stakeholders in the process. Thank you, Susan. Um, Antoine, I'll, I'll point the uh, sort of, I will sort of rephrase the question and, and be a bit more pointed. This uh, sort of, we speak about, I think Yuba has mentioned uh, inclusive governance, and also now uh, Susan has spoken to, to, to meaningful inclusion. Um, I mean, there, there's, there's political reasons and power reasons why people are being left out and why they are not being represented. If I would ask you whether you would have come across an alliance, a partnership, a solidarity movement that was very specific about this power differential and how it was overcome, is there anything that you can share with participants that this and this was really instrumental in addressing this, this power gap? I can find of a, of a concrete example, yes, and I will come to that in a second, but just right now to absolutely fully support what Susan has just said. I mean, there cannot be a transformational effect, there cannot be a meaningful inclusion if we do not work with the people that are actually making the difference. And we need to work together, we need to work in solidarity to find a way to have these people in on the table when we have all these policies put together. Because otherwise, it would just be yet another way of imposing uh, a cooperation policy from the exterior, which will have no relation to the reality of the people, and eventually it will have very, very limited impact. So just to fully support Susan on that, uh, on that particular point, although it is obviously not easy considering the, the diversity, of course, of situation. In terms of a one concrete example that I could think of is, of, is a, uh, a project that I was involved with a few years back in the Western Africa. And it was to, fight, uh, to support small farmers to fight against fruit flies on, in their mangoes, the mangoes that we need to be ensured to not have been infected by fruit flies in order to be exported to the European Union. So a very, uh, of course, important project, and it has supported a lot of, sort of small farmers in the Western African region, who eventually managed to um, uh, increase their, their export and their revenues for um, um, overall. And how did we do that? Exactly what, what we have just said. This was not an imposition. We did not come in with like, okay, this is how you're going to produce your mangoes, this is how you're going to keep your fruit flies at bay, this is how it's going to work, and then this is how you're going to export to the EU. No, absolutely not. The, the program arrived almost empty-ended with the, the will to support, and we uh, discussing with the small farmers like, okay, how do you do at the moment? How do you think you could do if you had the proper support. And we eventually came up with some nets systems, with some communication systems based on cell phones uh, alert to say where the fruit flies the clouds would uh, go to and eventually which uh, fields they would impact. And, ex and eventually it became um, a success, I would say. But and why? Because exactly as we said, 
this came out with solution from the ground, from the farmers, from the producers who said, like, okay, this is what we do. This is how we could do if we were adequately supported. And eventually this is what we've done. Unfortunately, I have, so I have one good example, which I'm glad, but unfortunately in many cases, it does not work that way. If I may, from what Susan and uh, Adrian indicated, because they all said that something that works, but the missing link is that there's no interaction between the three clusters. The policy, because the policy will scale out the, ex the, 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 the experience that Susan indicated, this is natural regreening because it cannot go without. And then also what is missing is the knowledge system because it has to be part of the uh, learning process, the education systems. What Antoine indicated also is bypassing the policy, is bypassing the local knowledge system also, because we need to have the interaction and we need to have the intervention of those three different clusters in each of the activities, because each of them have something to play, a role to play. Because the knowledge system is encapsulating the experience and translating to the uh, training programs and the different other. And then at the policy level, you need to scale out the experience the, uh, that, that, that work at the, the, the local level. Sorry to be to No, no, that's perfect. Uh, and, and Kumi, please brace yourself. Uh, the, the next question, sort of, I will give you the floor then afterwards. But I think I have one point that would, uh, sort of building on what the three of you have said. So the, Yuba, you just concluded with saying the, the upscaling, but the upscaling often, at least from my point of view, doesn't take place because this enabling environment is simply not there and the necessary leverage or force cannot build, be built up from the local level to actually achieve the policy change. So I, I think I'd like to get back, uh, give back the question to you, sort of what is that if we adopt a look at scaling from a more political perspective, again, can you share an example? Is there something that you think we could learn from if such movements are actually to be supported, let's say by European actors? No, I, I think that, you know, back to the 80s, uh, it was the European Commission at that time, and then they tried to define their energy policy because at that time that was after the second oil shock. And they said that the only way they can clearly well articulate their energy policy, they have to get developing countries to articulate their own energy policy from their own perspective. And then they supported a program in which I was involved in, which is a cooperative program on energy and development. And each of the, they, they get a think tank from the different region, from Africa, from Asia, from Latin America. And each of you know, the, uh, those uh, institutions, think tanks, look at the same problem in their own perspective. There were no single ready-made solution, one size fits all. And then through that, the program, after the research, we initiated a training program. This is how the first energy planning program started in African context. And then from that, that influenced the policies at the national level. And then those are some of the experiences we need to look at it. And then the, uh, in order to be able, we are all talking actually transformative changes. We do have no idea what those transformative changes means. It's only to take words, but we are not, if you want to bring the transformative changes, you have to start working and then to dig in at the national level, at the local level, and then to bring you know, the knowledge system, to bring the policy, and then to bring the practices. And then the interaction of those three different elements will bring the transformative changes that are required at the scale that's required. Thank you, Yuba. I would like to ask our distinguished panelists to please stay on the call. We will now um, like to ask Kumi to please make his intervention and then we'll have a, a panel discussion uh, together with Kumi. Kumi, I hope our various digital hiccups did not lead to you uh, sort of, no, <laughs> okay. So um, Kumi Naidu is with us. Uh, I think he can probably speak as very few others from through the question of 
act from the point of view of activism on how to achieve change. We are honored uh, to have you with us. It's a pleasure to have you. Kumi, I'll hand over to you, and then we have uh, a panel discussion. Thanks for being with us. Thank you very much, uh, Jess and everybody. I, I'm reminded of a moment during the South African liberation struggle. If you followed the kinds of contributions that we've had, uh, both in the first session and in the second session, you usually started by saying, most of the really good points I wanted to make have been eloquently made by the previous speakers. And then you said, however, for emphasis, and then you spoke for about two hours. Uh, so let me keep my comments brief and just say that I think everything that needs to be said has been put on the table. And I think the point that gets stressed most is the gap between roughly knowing what to do and actually getting it done, right? I mean, a lot of what we are talking about is not fundamentally rocket science, but it requires political will and it requires a different mindset, both on the part of our leaders in Africa, both political and business leaders, as well as leaders in Europe. And again, I say political and business leaders, because I think there is two power <laughs> streams that are big players in the question of food security and land use in Africa. And in some ways, corporate actors are as powerful in actually contributing to some of the challenges as governments themselves are. Now, I wanna do something that I thought, you know, was the door was opened by our sister Mimi from Cape Town. And I hope she's still there because I was so inspired by what she said. Uh, yes, I see she's still there. Um, that the way we, the biggest challenge for us is that the conversations that we're having, including this one, we are not able to engage the people that really need to be part of the conversation because of the language, the complexity, the issues, technology, and so on. So in this way, I'm gonna say something quite blunt, right? And that is, if we are saying, as we've been saying, to address the climate crisis, it cannot be business as usual, it cannot be government as usual, it cannot be philanthropy as usual, and I would add, it cannot be activism as usual. And there is a need for us to in a context where the science is telling us that we are all living in the most consequential decade in humanity's history. And I don't think that is too much of an exaggeration. I believe what we are able to achieve in the next 10 years will determine what kind of future we'll have or whether we will have a future at all. So it is in that context that I think all of us now, irrespective of which sector we find ourselves in, must humble ourselves, be willing to look at how we are functioning and remind ourselves of what Albert Einstein once said when he said the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting to get different results. And I want to be honest with you, if I reflect on my life of more than 40 years of activism, I can safely put up my hand and say, I meet that definition of insanity. Now it doesn't, many of the, tactical errors and so on we made, most of us probably made it with a clean art, with good intention and so on. But the stakes are so high right now that there cannot be any space for ego, any space for us, um, you know, being economical with the truth. And we need to actually um, look the people that we are seeking to serve and in whose names we speak in the eye. And if we cannot say to these people, I don't think we can say to the people that we work with that we have a pathway out of this mess that's been created. We cannot in good conscience do that right now because there's so many blockages from so many levels. But I want to focus on what Mimi said about thinking about bridging this gap, right? And I would conclude this introductory comment before I share with you a resource that I've developed, which hopefully will be helpful by saying that one of the things almost all sectors have in common as an error when we think about the people is that we very often are focusing on what people don't have 
right? We're focusing on how they're excluded, how they're marginalized, how they're oppressed, how they are repressed and uh, exploited and so on. Of course, we need to do that because that's the reality that we start from. However, if we do that in a way that forgets to recognize that notwithstanding all of that, notwithstanding all of that disempowerment, people have still clung on to power. People have capabilities. People have knowledge, indigenous knowledge. Uh, people have a whole range of capabilities. And unless our interventions are aimed at helping pick up that capability and harnessing it for having the kind of push on our policymakers and so on to generate the political will, then I don't think we stand a chance. So I'm going to share with you a, and, I, and now I'm scared about my competency here with the electronics after Germany gets it wrong. I mean, how can I get it right is my, is my sense here. Yeah. <laughs> but let's see. Uh, I want to share, and let's see if I have the rights. No, I am not allowed. Oh, disabled participant screen sharing. Uh, so, sorry, uh, Kumi. We have we, we put we are, we're happy to put your screen uh, your slide please. on. It was on already, but now it has disappeared again. So I would turn oh. my hoping eye to Bruno to oh, please. Oh yes, I see it. Okay. I see. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry about that. So essentially, um, I've I've been trying to look at this question of how can we understand all the capabilities, all the centers of power that people have to push for fast accelerated change in a context where we've got a climate clock that is mercilessly ticking and telling us we are running out of time, right? So I've divided things into four quadrants here. On the one hand, I've got, uh, on the top left, it's about harnessing people's autonomy. The bottom left, it's harnessing our creative participation. On the top right, it's harnessing our wealth. And the bottom right, it's harnessing our consumption. But each of those circles in each of those four quadrants, we have to read it from the center and to just remind us what are the power and capabilities people have and then look at how we can support people to be able to harness and deploy that. So if we start with the harnessing our autonomy, people have power as citizens and voters. Now, let's be blunt about it. In many countries around the world, we have the form of democracy without the substance of democracy. We might have elections, but we don't necessarily have democracy. And elections have become, in many places, a preordained elite legitimation exercise. Now, I would still argue that notwithstanding all of those defects, right, that we need to do all we can with greater creativity to harness and push to ensure that we get We'll never get perfect outcomes in terms of election outcomes, but we need to do much better than what we are achieving because we essentially have, if you want to be kind, fascist-like, if you want to be unkind, fascist in power in places like India, Bolsonaro uh, so in Brazil, uh, Modi in India, Orban in Hungary, um, uh, Trump when he was in the White House. Okay? So I would strongly urge that even though there's a temptation on the part of civil society to walk away from the formal electoral processes, I think we need to not leave that site of struggle vacant. We have to be able to engage there. The second thing is people have power as enforcers of transparency and accountability. In multiple countries, we can show that where governments were trying, including my own South Africa, where there was major attempts to hide the industrial scale looting of the Zuma government, we have begun the process of getting back some of those monies, nowhere near what was stolen, but at least you can see that people through alternative media, creative activism and so on, including whistleblowers being killed in the process and so on, but you can see that in fact there's uh, power there. The third area is People have power as shapers of our own destiny through movements, trade unions, social movements, NGOs, and so on. Yeah, though, I just want to say that I believe there's been an over-reliance on this cluster of organizations when we've tried to aggregate power. Even as we have seen that the impact and the 
power of these institutions have been in decline. The resourcing base has been compromised because there's such a high rel reliance on the North and so on. But notwithstanding that, the, these cluster of organizations, especially social movements, and in, including social movements that are focused especially on land rights, food sovereignty, uh, and so on, are critically important. And we need to obviously build them as best and as inclusive as possible. Then people have power as volunteers taking private action for public good. And I want to acknowledge what was said in the summary of the first section when COVID and how COVID shows us the absence of international solidarity, the backward thinking of the rich countries of the world and so on. And just note that in many parts of the world, if it was not for volunteer action, hundreds of thousands of people would have just perished as a result of not having access to food, water, and other basic necessities. Then if we move to how people have power in terms of creative participation and the point that Mimi made more eloquently Kumi, than I'm going to try and do here, Kumi, is I'm, that people... I'm, I'm terribly sorry to, to intervene. I have a question. Would, may I ask you to please introduce each quadrant and then we can, in the panel discussion, return to the individual, in the individual bubbles. Would this be possible? Yes, so I stop there and, 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 and get the reaction of the panel on the, on, on the first set that I've just run through. That's fine with me if that's the proposal. Uh, now, I was wondering whether you could also introduce the other three uh, quadrants um, as sort of the, and then we move to the panel discussion if this would work for you. Okay, I'll be very quick then. Uh, do I have two minutes to do that? Yes, of course. Okay, so then I was just about to say, honestly, our creative participation is really, you know, let me just give you an example from South Africa. We would never have been able to mobilize our people where most of our people were left consciously without education and were, uh, and were left non-literate, right? And the way we mobilize people, and there's many examples all over the African continent of how we have done in the past and we're doing still today, moving people through using arts and culture as a way to mobilize. And here's the sad news. When we look at it globally, including on our continent, some of the most reactionary backward fascist forces, right? Like Steve Bannon, uh, Trump's um, campaign manager, understands something that many of us who are pushing to do the right thing don't understand, that politics does not drive culture. Culture drives politics and culture drives everything. And unless we seriously get serious about understanding where people's cultural rhythms are, we don't succeed. Uh, then in the interest of time, just on wealth, now, people might say, well, you know, poor people, we don't have too much of money and so on. True. But we have more power in the space than we are willing, that we are sometimes willing to believe. Right? And I give you a northern example, but I believe it, it can apply to the global south as well. In Australia, when the government there was pushing to build the coal, biggest coal mine in 2015, ordinary citizens some had 10 Australian dollars, some had 10 million Australian dollars, mobilized and went out of the banks every weekend saying, you will not fund this project, which is going to kill our agriculture, is going to kill our children's futures, and so on. And eventually, all four banks said they won't put money behind it. It slowed it and reduced it. That didn't kill it completely, the project. Sadly, it's still going ahead through state funding. But again, it's about how we can better understand our capability. And, and, and it's not to say that we have the power sitting there. We have the power that needs to be mobilized creatively. And the last dimension on consumption. Yeah, we, again, there's lots of examples we can draw on where if we get organized and say to those that are exploiting workers, that are poisoning our lands by using uh, pesticides and so on, um, that we are going to hold back our purchasing power from you. Uh, I think we have more power in the space than, um, than we imagine. So let me just stop there and conclude with saying, none of what I've just run through is easy, but I believe it's all possible. And I believe that it is within our capability and creativity and so on 
to do this. But And I believe if we don't do this and we only focus on what people don't have and how disempowered people are and so on, we contribute to a, unwittingly, to a framing of people's space in society, ordinary people's space in society that ultimately is self-defeating. So thank you very much. I hope that made sense. And I throw it over to the moderators and the panel to react to those comments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kumi. And really, thank you so much, especially for turning our whole framing of the missing middle as a sort of negative empty space <laughs> into a positive space and, and really talking about harnessing and really looking at the positive attributes that people have and how to bring those into the conversation. I think it's a fantastic way to sort of really wrap up this final session, really looking beyond what's negative, what's missing to what can we actually tap. And so I'm going to just ask the panel, maybe because uh, Alexander is just joining us and Corina as well, if she's still there. Uh, if you don't mind, maybe we can just ask you to start and maybe pick up one of the quadrants that Kumi was mentioning and maybe just tell us how do you see, what's your vision of how we can start to recapture the positive attributes in a sense? How can we bring people into the equation from a positive uh, perspective in a sense and, and to so to really fill this missing middle. Please, Alexander and then Corina, and then we'll ask the rest of the panel to please also say something. Thanks a lot, Wangu. Th that's a real challenge, I have to say. And, and therefore, I would like to start with the easy answers. What I especially like is that these four quadrants showcase that in the end, it's not only capital, that's the quadrant on the right top, uh, harnessing the, the capital, harnessing the wealth. So it is looking at the financial flows, it is looking at capital and investment, but it makes very clear this is only one part of the solution, a necessary part of the solution, but it is a part of the solution. And it reminds me on a debate that is taking place, I hope even stronger in the future, about is it completely wrong that our economy is based only on produced capital, only on money? And why aren't we looking at natural capital, social capital and human capital? And I'm convinced and I see similarities that the debate on true cost accounting fits very well to what has been presented here. If we don't take into account the natural capital, which is the basis of food production, for example, we are going to fail and uh, human capital as uh, expressed in, in the quadrant on, on the top left, autonomy can, can really seen as something similar. So what I really like is that we don't focus narrowly on financial flows only. Money is necessary, it has, we need investments, but we look at all the necessary ingredients in order to start a, transfor a transformative process, at least this is my understanding, what I have just seen for the first time and what I really like a lot. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Corinna, please have the floor. Yeah, thank you uh, very much. And also thanks to um, uh, yeah, this very good input. And um, uh, thanks to Alexander first, uh, for the first um, uh, yeah, uh, assumption. Um, I would like to... Um, uh, yeah, bring uh, to, to underline that I think the what shows exactly is that the power lies in the hand of the local of the uh, local uh, authorities on the ground, and this is what we should focus on. But I would like to um, bring together what all these quadrants have together, in my opinion, and what I think was very obvious also from the two panels what we have heard, and this is the issue of a good communication. We need to communicate. So we have heard that all, um, that there are different clusters, that we have the knowledge, that we have the political system, that we have uh, the regional and, and, uh, and the local system. And one of the key issues is how can we bring them uh, to communicate? And I see this also in these quadrants. How can we bring these all together and uh, to um, uh, yeah, and, and to come up with uh, some um, 
common understanding. Um, I see also that uh, part, as part of the communication is also the listening, which means we, of course, as a funding um, uh, uh, country, we have to listen to all these people. We have heard that uh, Africans has to be in the driving seat by all these projects. I fully agree, but the main task is how we can find the right people we have to listen, how we can find the right voices um, uh, and to bring it then together. Um, as a, this is then part of how we can also elaborate on best practices. I mean, we, we have a lot of examples of best practices, um, but can we then also uh, have a best practice in one country and without any adjustment, bring it to, to a, a, another country? not only in Africa, I mean also in Latin America. And so this is, I think, the main challenge and everything is based on a very good communication and the listening to each other, to listening to the people who have uh, the power in all these uh, different problems. Thank you. Thank you. And maybe Susan, to just pick up on the analogy that Alexander just gave us of the other capitals as well, so not just finance. I mean, and you're really very much in the natural capital space. So I don't know, maybe I push you in a corner, but maybe some maybe positive attributes of how we can harness that kind of positive energy uh, from nature. First of all, excellent discussion, Kumi. You got my mind, you know, sort of completely, um, uh, you know, thinking the other way at uh, that focus on, on what people really have as opposed to focusing on what people don't have. I, I think I'll pick a little bit in terms of, 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 of the paradox and, and the challenge that I find in this narrative. And I admit that come, I don't come from a social activist space, but I can see the power of the framework that Kumi presented here. I can see its power, but I'd just like to mention here a little bit in terms of the paradox that it presents in my mind. And for instance, those of us who've been involved in the food systems dialogue, we know very well it has been one of the most challenging space because as you mentioned, there's corporate interest, there's business uh, a government interest, there's all sorts of interest in terms of food system transformation. So for instance, in Africa, should we be pushing for a green revolution model? Should we be talking about green revolution in food systems transformation that involves you know, use of external inputs to be able to increase productivity? Can we increase productivity for a growing population on a limited piece of land without expanding into a natural ecosystems. And there are you know, arguments for that. And that's why agroecological transitions and agroecology has become a powerful movement because it not only looks at production aspects, but also the power of social movement in what you are mentioning that we can be able to say to the business interest, hey, if you continue pushing on your pesticides, on your, on your we can withhold our purchasing power. And, and, and But for me, what is really a paradox is that it's also an economic model. And now I'll come down to my mother as a farmer. I'm brought up by a single mom who's a smallholder farmer who have seen struggle to, to be able to increase the productivity in our two acres piece of land. And the question is, when I try to discuss with her in terms of transformation, she's like, but I do need to increase my food. I, didn't, I do need a fertilizer. It's, and, and, and sort of the, the, the producer companies, the pesticides, the agriculture, the, 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 the synthetic fertilizer companies have, have really pushed this as an economic model that you cannot be able to increase your productivity without really, and especially in Africa, there's so much strong arguments around this. So my question is, so I'm, I'm struggling with that dichotomy because we, we as Africa, nobody wants to see a picture of an African child starving. Nobody wants to see the picture of a Turkana woman in the airport in the north when you cross around the airport with a begging bowl. We do want to see productivity increasing. But on the other hand, we know very well that we do need technologies and practices, and we do need social movements that can be able to come again is that economic model that has been largely responsible for development since 1940s, 1950s. So for me, Kumi, I'm not trying to separate all that framework, but it's asking ourselves, how do we unshackle ourselves from a very entrenched economic model that we are all beneficiaries of <laughs> to be able to transition to something that we are all proud of? Let me pause there. Okay. 
thank you, Susan. Uh, now, uh, I am wondering whether Mimi is still in the call, because if you are Mimi, we would like to give you the floor as well to respond to Kumi. And until then, if you feel like joining us in the panel again, Alexander has a question to, to Yuba. I have a question. Yes. Yes, and my question is a very simple one, uh, because Yuba, you made twice reference to, do we really know how a transformation looks like? And I think this is one of the key questions we, we have to address. Very often in global uh, meetings, we hear we need a radical transformation. In the end, it's more efficiency. And it doesn't address the real question of change. And, and therefore, uh, Yuba, could you please reflect a little bit more on how to set up a process to come to an understanding what transformation means based on the concrete needs of the people and based on the concrete conditions of agroecological conditions? You know, the, there is a paradox. The paradox is that in the African context, it is not a transformation, it's jump-starting. Because in the European context, there is a transformation because it's the weakness of the system that has been put in place because you need to transform the energy system in the European context. That is why the transition is needed. You need to transform the agricultural system because we need, we have seen the result of the system that has been put in place. The paradox is that in the African context, we are in an early stage of developing the agricultural system. It can take different directions. At least we know what is not good for that. But unfortunately, we are not taking that. We need to build the energy system. And then we need also to build the urbanization system. Unfortunately, when we said urbanization system in Africa, we have in mind the cities in Europe. Because the cities in Africa are completely different from the, what we mean by cities. Because it's part of infrastructure of cities in Europe and a large part of rural way of living. And then so we need to define that completely differently. Unless we do that, we cannot make any transformation. And I think that Susan indicated that, who said that we go, we have to find the right institution. We do have right institution, but the institution we have in Africa, in most of the countries are not fit for purpose. And this is the case of all Europe. Because, but in the European context, you can easily bring together competencies in different places and then to put them together to solve a problem. The problem in the African context, by using projects, we bypass our institutions. And then we say that they are not working, they are weak, and then we draw resources from the institution to implement projects and then think will never work. And then we need to change, if we are not changing our mentality to say that we do not have the right institution in place, how we can transform those institutions. How we can move from, uh, you know, perpetuating institutions and then securing our own comfort and then to create a problem solving institutions. It's completely different way. And then this apply to everywhere, including the UN system because they are not fit for purpose. And they are there to perpetuate themselves. And people who are there, they want to maintain their own position. And then we have to move from that. And then for the problem solving institutions are the farmer are doing, as the herder are doing, are those who are also fishing are doing, the fishermen are doing. And then this is in a very, in a nutshell, my reaction to your very important question. Are you willing to leave our own comfort and then to move toward a problem solving institutions? Thank you very much, Thank Yuba. You. Thank you very much for that answer. And I think I'm going to come back now to Mimi because you started off by saying that you felt like a statistic almost and that we talked about the issue of, of language and culture. And Kumi has given us a kind of framework where we can actually start to see this in a positive way. 
how, how did you listen to that? And how, does it give you hope? Where do you, can you see entry points maybe from where you stand in, at, at, your, at the community level? You muted Mimi. Mimi, you muted. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so um, definitely, um, I think, um, it, it, uh, I mean, from both, it, it, I, I also feel very empowered. Um, uh, so also for, um, from Kumi for, for, for echoing me in, in, in that. Um, so now I feel a lot more confident in also speaking, especially as, a, as, an, as an artist um, in, in that. Um, and it, it, I really have had no choice um, in terms of my background. I haven't really had a choice to really think about um, or, or approaching my issues from the point of not having. I've really had to exercise this sort of what I do have um, and, 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 um, and sort of um, trying to bridge solutions for myself and, I thought I, and for the community around me. Um, and the one thing that I, uh, the one way that I've, uh, I felt that we, we could do that is definitely using art as a sort of um, cultural analysis. Um, or, 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 um, and because my, my background is also in literature, um, I've, I've seen literature as the sort of mode for people to be able to read themselves um, into stories. And, and, and I think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of political sort of awareness in the stories that uh, we tell and the content that we even consume. And, um, and this is definitely going, I, I'm going to also head towards um, where the, the youth and, and what they are watching and, and, and the conversations that they are having. I mean, art would be a great way to sort of also engage um, young people into, um, into being able to look at, I don't, you know, um, look at um, policies, look at their place in the world and look at how they can influence uh, and this, this, and also coming back then from the the the, the perspective of um, perhaps even um, research and, and information sharing and being able to, I, um, I think uh, in, in my experience and COVID has really also hit um, so, sort of um, artists in South Africa really hard. But when I look at really what is going on and the work that people are producing and um, the work that I'm hoping to sort of produce in terms of reflecting um, uh, food security um, is, is that there's a really powerful chance to really use art as a sort of cultural analysis and to relay these messages that uh, we don't necessarily know how to express verbally um, in, the, in the simple sense how I'm doing right now. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I'm going to make the example of music again, because um, it, when you listen to a song and you don't really even understand the language, but the emotions and everything, you know, <laughs> they, 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 they come through and you, and you understand. Um, and so I, 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 there's, there's, I think there's always a bridge to really communicate and we need to push those boundaries in, in, in how we share this information. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mimi. I'd, I'd like to give Antoine the word to please reflect on uh, the uh, on the sort of the conceptual framework that Kumi has presented, and then Kumi, it's over to you to respond to what you've heard, and then uh, the two uh, co-chairs will will conclude, Alexander and and Garrett. But first, Antoine, brief response. Then Kumi, you have a chance to reflect, and then our oh, MZs, uh, Antoine. And thank you, Mimi, thank you. really. Thank you. thank you very much. And uh, yes, I think, Kumi, your presentation was uh, very enlightening the way that it's, it takes us out, as I said, of the only the financial aspect of it and the capital aspect of it as a power mean, and to, to, to show that we can go further. And for me, it relates <clears throat> very much when we talk about the EU cooperation policy again and what we consider a success in terms of a cooperation policy. And success will all usually be measured by a financial mean of some way, and and it should be it could be much broader than that. So this is where how your your uh, visual tool actually kind of I think helped me also to to envisage that in a, in, a, in a different way. For that I was I was very very I was very very grateful. Now Kumi, with all the praise you've got, what do you make out of this? 
Well, thank you for your very kind and generous comments. Let me just start with Corina first. And Corina said, what is needed is good communication. And she's absolutely right. The way I'd like to say it is, you know, in property, when you're buying property, they say it's location, location, location. With activism, it's communication, communication, communication. And she's absolutely right. And if you look at the bottom left-hand quadrant on creative participation, as well as harnessing our autonomy, if we don't get communications right, we don't move things forward. And I just want to say to Mimi, uh, you, you brought a very warm memory to my mind as a 16-year-old, 17-year-old activist when I was singing Zulu freedom songs. I didn't know what they meant actually at that time, but it didn't matter. It didn't matter. The vibe was right. The solidarity was right. It gave you energy. You might have known one or two words here and there, but like you didn't know everything, but it didn't matter, right? But, but, it, but it just energized me as a young person in a way that I've seen it in elsewhere in the world in, in my work since. Um, Yoba's point, and, um, and I believe others have already, and, and you as well, Anton, made this point about it took it beyond finance. But actually, at one level, it's fundamentally about finance, right? In the sense, how do we unlock the resources we need to push an agroecology revolution in a way, right? And that means rethinking the way finances currently operate completely. So, but a lot of the pieces, right, are actually quite financially connected, right? Even if you take certainly on the right-hand side, both the consumption capability and, and harnessing our wealth. But in some ways, you need the other two areas of autonomy and participation to give us a chance to shift finance in the way, because we don't have the power to speak to the most powerful institutions that we have, then we don't have a chance. And Yoba, uh, Yoba very eloquently spoke about the food system not working, the energy system not working, and so on. And, 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 and I link that to what Susan said, when Susan said, you know, what is needed is for us to rethink the very economic system. And, and, and I think we must eventually, you know, recognize that the economic system is fundamentally broken. And the problem here is we're trying to fix these problems by almost imagining that the economic system stays exactly as it is. And if we think about what happened after the global financial crisis in 2008, 2009, what we saw, those with power, that was a teachable moment. That was a moment to learn from, you know, greed gone out of control, uh, increasing autonomy of uh, corporate power and, and, and so on. And what we saw those with power respond with was system recovery, system maintenance, and system protection. What was needed then and what is needed even much more urgently right now is system innovation, system redesign, and system transformation. If we think that to get out of this mess that we are in right now, incremental tinkering is going to get us to the promised land, forget it. If we think that just rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic is going to get us to where we need to be while humanity sinks, then in fact, we're not reading, I believe, the urgency of the moment sufficiently enough. So what I think, if I can bring a word that has been hovering over this discussion, uh, and I'd like to conclude with this word, and I think two people mentioned it, I think what this work really needs on land use, food, agriculture, and climate, we have to bring the word that was given to us as a gift by the feminist movement decades ago that far too many of us chose to ignore, and that word is intersectionality, right? We have to understand better the intersections between these different pieces that we are doing, and unless we are able to do that, like, for example, we didn't speak much about transport in this whole conversation, right? But we know how critical transportation systems are to getting food to markets, for example, right? So I would just conclude by saying that, you know, there are two ways we can see the world. One, we can see the world as, oh my God, everything is coming and like it's, and it's just overflowing us. 
or we can see it coming and we say we refuse, we refuse to let it to overwhelm us. We're going to push back at it and we're going to continue to push back until we find the best solutions to eventually push completely on the other way. We cannot be dishonest with ourselves. We're in a very difficult moment with the cards stacked against us. But I want to believe that there's enough people in the world who refuse to accept that the world that we live in right now is the best that humanity can create for itself. And I take huge faith in young people like Mimi and many others, right, who are imagining and daring to believe different ways of being, different ways of acting, different ways of pushing for the demands. And for that reason, I would like to end by saying thank you for making me feel optimistic at the end of this conversation. I hope you are feeling slightly more optimistic than when you came into the conversation as well. Thank you, Shen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kumi. Anything that I would have to add would dilute your message, so I'll hand over to Alexander and then to Gary. Thank you very much, all, really. You have been a fantastic crowd. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot, yes. Uh, I would like to use three keywords I have heard uh, all over in, in the debate. Responsibility, solidarity, and partnerships. And I think we will need them all three. Responsibility is important to make again very clear that the global north has a responsibility to reduce its emissions drastically and as soon as possible. Just to give you an example, the world has emitted until now around 2,500 gigatons of CO2 into the atmosphere. 2,500. And if we want to stay below 1.5 degrees, there are only 500 gigatons left. The question is, who has the right to emit them? Is it equally distributed between all countries? Has every human being the right to emit the same amount of CO2, or are we just ignoring it? And therefore, it's our responsibility to drastically reduce. Second, I like the introduction of the word solidarity. But I think it needs a little bit more thinking what solidarity really means. Do we need new global public goods? Do we need access to global weather data free of charge for everybody? Do we need kind of a solidarity which allows the poorest people to have the same access to information than we have? And I mentioned it previously, access to vaccines is a question. And therefore, solidarity has to be spelled out because solidarity doesn't mean to give a little bit of money. Solidarity means creating new and different relationships and last partnerships. What I have learned in this session is that partnerships is never a one-way street. A partnership with African country could mean that we in the global north learn from countries in a semi-arid area how to deal with weather events. There are countries who have a huge knowledge about practices of agroforestry in Europe, we just start. And therefore, maybe the word partnership means that we have to start a new type of partnership where we jointly learn, where we share information, but where in the end we bring with the partnerships responsibility and solidarity together. And therefore, my three words are responsibility, solidarity, and partnerships in order to bring the dialogue to something meaningful on the ground. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you, Bess and, uh, Bess and Yangu. <laughs> yes and Wangu. <laughs> and thanks to all our amazing panelists for this inspired debate. Uh, it's not often you find yourself at the end of a two and a half hours virtual debate wishing for it to continue. Um, I can really not add anything on this debate by such a, of substance uh, of the debate by this distinguished round of experts and with so much power and determination. Uh, but let me just try to conclude with a few of our thoughts also on that, that also guided us in the foundation in uh, the decision to host this event series. Uh, first of all, we at the Foundation, we really truly believe that progress in global efforts to address the climate crisis require new partnerships between Africa and Europe. This, the discussions we just um, 
had have shown that, that these partnerships need to further empower civil society and community-based organizations. And as Kumi just pointed out so eloquently, people do have agency. And this agency needs to be strengthened through partnerships that are built on the principle that individuals and organizations from both Africa and Europe meet on equal terms to learn from each other and also maybe um, that we in Europe will see how much we have to learn from our colleagues um, on the sub in Sub-Saharan Africa. I'm really proud that both our events have shown, uh, have provided evidence, I think, that such new partnerships can be possible. Um, second thought, the progressive realization of people's rights must be the foundational principle in our work to achieve food security and climate resilience. Poverty and inequality are root causes of vulnerability and hunger and need to be proactively addressed through rights-based approaches. From where I stand, both dialogues have underscored this point. The brilliant and diverse contributions by civil society partners have also shown that there are organizations out there who can be partners in this and who really should have a central role in new partnerships between Africa and Europe. And last but not least, these rights-based approaches are essential when we discuss the impact of climate policies on land use. Climate mitigation and adaptation policies need to recognize people's legitimate rights to land. Referring back to Faith's contribution uh, earlier today, it is clear that just transitions need to be thoroughly anchor anchored in people's rights, especially, if not inclusively, but especially to the rights of indigenous peoples and women and youth. Our dialogues, again, have shown that there is a universe of organizations out there that can build the link between communities and national and even international climate policies. And I would hope, from where I stand now, that the role of philanthropy in this could be to enable those actors and to help create spaces for that dialogue. So, to conclude, I just would like to thank you all for following these events thank our amazing panelists, also Yes and Vangu for the great moderation, the, the, the wonderful team here at TMG, uh, here in the foundation and uh, from TMG, who have been working really hard to make this event a success. And uh, just let me finish by saying, please keep watching this space as we really hope that we can continue this discussion, this, this important dialogue in the not too distant future. Thank you.